Well, I look ghostly, calling from you from the underworld on All Hallows Eve 2020. <laughs> no, just me. Bon Journal being an idiot on Halloween afternoon 2020, Saturday. Um, coming to you from Bon Journal Mansion today. Needed to do something theatrical. So, I have my bag of tricks. Hopefully, all of you ghouls and goblins will have a creepy crawly time tonight. Just trying to get into the. Halloween spirit and um, get up on some stuff, get up on some bullet points, get up on whatnot. Um, let me take my robe off. Time to take the robe off, Bonjour. Has Mr. Bonjour lost it? I don't know. to get into that Halloween spirit. It's kind of hard this year, you know, considering the fact that real life is providing a lot more chills and spills and just outright horror and uh, creepy things um, than um, any um, creepy horror film could possibly um, sum it up. Um, having said that, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing right now. Probably just laying low. Um, let's get up. Let's get on some bullet points. Bullet points. Bullet points. Um, for this coming Tuesday, for this week, um, we're getting into photography, specifically um, theories on photography, different uh, um, writers, different essays concerning uh, photography, and um, trying to wrap their heads around the ways in which we use photography. Why it's like and the changes that were made in human culture due to the um due to the appearance of photography. How it would change our relationships to time and space. And we've already gone through a lot of this with Berger and Berger will um in chapter one of Ways of Seeing, Berger will talk about the arrival of photography, and um, he'll talk about this idea of how, specifically in the world of art, it would bring it would make the world somewhat smaller and bring things closer to us. You know, and we'll find that you know, with all different forms of media, there is always this kind of um, what Marshall McLuhan would call this kind of extension of our senses. You know, and this kind of chain and, and this difference in the way that we apprehend the world, and this will come, you know, in, in different ways, whether it be, you know, through printing, through um, art, through photography, and then film, and then and now video, and then the internet, that it will change the ways in which we interact on every different level, you know, not just, you know, due to the medium, but 
It will change the ways in which we interact sociologically, culturally, philosophically. It will change our politics. You know, and this is what Susan Sontag will bring up in her essay um, in Plato's Cave. All right? And we've already kind of talked about um, Plato's Cave um, and relate the uh, parable of Plato's Cave in relation to the Matrix, we've talked about um, his um, parable of the cave, you know, this idea of being um, inside a world um, that is a possible illusion, you know, and, um, and consists of images as opposed to reality, right? And the Matrix will kind of tap into that idea, you know, and, so, and, and with Sontag... She is using the metaphor in somewhat of a similar way, you know, um, that we are kind of in a cave of images, surrounded by images that we have produced. Um, and she wants to, like, kind of turn the cube around on each side to kind of explore the different aspects of photography. Like, why do we do it? Why do we do it? It's like, what is the, what is the drive in mankind to want to... Um, acquire photographs of everything, you know, and nowadays with like Instagram and Facebook and all these other different apps, you know, this idea of like being able to transmit images instantaneously as soon as we um, take, the, uh, take them and project them back out to other people, it begs the question like what, how is reality configured for us, you know, how is the idea of the real... How do we live this lived experience through photos? And what purpose, you know, what negative and positive purposes do um, photography um, provide us with? All right? Because, you know, with each of these essays, and even with Berger, you know, um, they're going to talk about, especially Sontag, she's going to talk about this idea of photography as a medium being a double-edged sword that it provides us with stuff, but it also takes away, takes away in certain ways. In every media, in every new medium, there's always something is um, new and something is given to us, while at the same time something, we give something up, you know? And we need to be able to do this risk-benefit of analysis to understand um, what we're getting and what we're giving up, you know? And Sontag, and we're gonna like dig into Sontag. I know that Sontag is a difficult essay. It's kind of long. It takes a good hour to get, to get through it. On top of that, she makes a lot of references to things that um, are not necessarily dated, but a little bit obscure. She'll make references to films. She'll make references to certain um, political events. And it's really up to you guys to, when you get to something... Um, that she's making a reference to that you don't know about, um, my strong suggestion would be to go to Google, you know, or go to Wiki and figure out. It's like, you know, when she's talking about, you know, um, a film by Chris Marker, or, if, or, or if she's talking about um, the uh, 1871 Communard Revolution, That at that point, you should be kind of checking out, like, well, what's this lady talking about? You know, to be able to give it context. You know, to give her observations some context. All right. Um, once again, this essay appears in 1977 um, in a book called On Photography. We'll get into that. On Photography, and uh, and we and once again, not unlike Berger, we have to be able to start to pose the question. Are the observations that she makes in 1977, all right? No digital photography yet, folks. No internet, no Photoshop, none of that, all right? Are the observations that she makes about photography applicable to the world in 2020? You know, we need to be able to, like, kind of pose those questions and read the essay through those kinds of lenses, you know, to get, to get something out of it to get something, you know, concrete out of it, you know. So, we'll get into Sontag today. 
All right. We're probably only going to have time for Sontag. And then when we meet up on Tuesday, we'll hit those um, essays by um, Andre Bazan and Peter Benson. You should have all the links in the emails sent out to you to be able to read all three of them. All right. Because I'm going to, we'll see how each of them um, makes a case for the way in which photography kind of shapes our world. And, and, and specifically with Benson, um, writing like just a few years ago, what happens with the change from analog to digital photography, all right? And, 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 what, and, and what philosophical and psychological um, ramifications does that transition have? So there's, uh, there's all that coming up. Because I want to kind of get us prepped for um, midterm essays, midterm essays before um, the Thanksgiving break. De we definitely want to get a first draft out before the Thanksgiving break. Um, so I can use the Thanksgiving break to correct them, and then you'll, you'll have to do a second draft. Okay, um, I don't know where it falls necessarily on the syllabus, but I... I think we can like, you know, kind of, we need to kind of speed it up. As far as the um, essays that you just submitted um, last week, um, my journal will be getting them out to you ASAP, meaning sometime um, in, the, in the ensuing week, this coming week, 11-3, you'll be getting those back corrected. And... Uh, you won't have to do anything with those. You won't need to do a second draft with those unless you uh, want to, all right? You're gonna have the option of doing a second draft. If you're happy with your grade, um, no, no need to do anything. If you're, if you're not you know, necessarily happy with your grade and you wanna take the extra note um, and uh, kind, of, you know, kind of ramp it up, um, you're free to do that. You're going to be free to do that. However, it's not going to be essential. On the midterm essay, however, you're going to need to do two drafts. Two drafts. And what I usually do with that, in a brick and mortar setting, what I usually do is that um, when you hand in the second draft, I get a hard copy of the first draft stapled to the, the second draft. And why do I ask for that? Simply so that I can, like, compare the two, you know, because well, more often than not, a lot of people think that a second draft merely entails that one goes and hits print again <laughs> on the printer, you know, and, 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 you know, without doing anything, and that, that, you know, constitutes a second draft, and it's like, no, you know, a second draft entails that you make, you know, some changes, Take some of my suggestions to heart to make it a better paper, you know, and 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 do it. What's called a redraft. All right. So all that is coming. All right. So essays will be coming back next week, and then we'll be ramping up in the next week or so um, to get you guys prepared for the midterm. All right. The midterm essays. All right. No exams. All right. Don't get all crazy with me, no exams, but an essay that's going to be, we'll talk about the essay. It's going to be, you know, it's going to require, you know, a larger page count. I would say somewhere in the area of five pages, you know, and with this one, you're going to want to probably do some citations and use MLA format. We'll talk all about that. We'll talk all about that. No reason to get all crazy right now with this on Halloween night. You know, there's other things to do. So, there's that. There's all that. We've gone through this whole history of photography that we did on Tuesday. All right. We talked about uh, all the technical um, developments that needed to come together in the early days of photography. And um, what people were using photography for in the very, very early days. You know, um, and we talked about the, te the technology, we talked about it from the artistic angle, and at the same time, we talked about it in terms of its um, role in um, 
documenting things as a, as a as a way of like gaining knowledge of the world, you know. And you know, with the birth of photography, it's like there was all this kind of um, there was all this kind of like you know conflict about what photography what it could really be used for. You know, here we had this kind of miraculous event invention. And not unlike film, you know, a couple decades later, you know, all the eggheads kind of sat around and said, well, you know, it's like, now we have this thing. It's like, what can we do with it? You know, what, what, what can we use it for? You know, and there will be different opinions, you know, among that crew of, of elder eggheads. You know, some will be like, well, it's an art form. And others are like, no, it's like, it, it's used for scientific research. You know, there's other people are like, no, it's used for history. You know, all these different modalities in which photography um, would play a role, would play a role in, all right? Because it wasn't just one thing, right? And it's not, it's not just one thing in our own lives. You know, the difference between, you know, me, go, you know, like trotting your, you know, trotting a kid out for his, you know, his yearly high school photo, you know, the... the the, the the purpose of that is a far different purpose than, you know, me taking a photography class and having an artistic assignment and going out, you know, and, 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 and doing things artistically. The book was called On Photography. Um, came out around 1977. And this essay is a chapter in that book. It's a chapter in that book on photography, and it's called In Plato's Cave in Plato's cave, and we've talked about, you know, the cave, all right, and we'll talk about the way that she uses the allegory, and she uses the allegory in a different way than it's used in the Matrix, all right, but not necessarily totally, um, totally disconnected, you know, because she wants to say something about how we're kind of swimming in this world of images, and it becomes a challenge, you know, for us as a culture to be able to disseminate the real from the artificial, the real from the simulacra, you know, the real from, dare I say it, the fake, you know. Um, one of the first things that she'll say about photography, at least in, in modern times, all right, you know, there's a period, it's like, because we have to understand, Early 1800s, mid 1800s, late 19th century. Not everybody's got a camera yet. It's still kind of a a, a a very like a niche thing, you know. And people are more like hobbyists or or experimenting with it, you know, because it's still kind of expensive to do. And we talked about all that, you know. So that um, you know, you, it's like photography is still kind of a very specialized thing. You know, it's like if you wanted photo if you wanted photographs taken of your family or your wedding, you would go to a specific person who specialized in in this kind of and it, and and it still holds true today. You know, it's like you know people more often than not when they get married, they like you know they they book a photographer to come and take photos, and this person kind of does it for a living, all right, as opposed to us with our with our can with our iPhones and you know. Um, so there's, there's this kind of um, hierarchy of technical expertise um, that the lines have started to blur now that everyone's got a camera. You know, but this isn't necessarily a new thing. You know, this isn't necessarily a new thing in terms of the shift from like only a few people having a camera to a camera being in every household. Because by the, like the 50s and the 60s, it just becomes a thing. Everybody, every, every household has a camera. You know, even growing up in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, it's like, you know, my mother had a camera. And it usually came out, you know, for special occasions um, because um, it wasn't it wasn't instantaneous. You would like have rolls of film. You would have to go get it developed. So it wasn't something that you just, you know, you know, it, it, it costed, it, it, it was more costly to get um, photographs done, to get prints done. So it was usually reserved for like special occasions, you know, um, unless you had like, 
you know, a few shots left on a roll of film, you know, after the vacation or whatever, and you would take pictures of whatever, your cat or, you know, a bowl of soup or your receding hairline. Very early on, Sontag has to say this. She makes this statement. There's this insatiability, all right, and this insatiability, she'll say, of the photo fo- of, uh, uh, let me get wide here. She calls it an insatiability of the photo of the photographing eye. The very insatiability of the photographing eye changes the terms of confinement in the cave, all right? Our world. She's likening our world to a cave. And this insatiability that we have, this, what is, what is insatiability? It is this drive that seems to never be, or this desire that seems to never be quite um, satisfied. You know, that we just, we have this drive to take pictures, all right? And, and we just kind of almost do it, you know, in a kind of addictive way. You know, it's like, I mean, we can liken it to a kind of addiction, you know. Um, In teaching us a new visual code, she says, in teaching us a new visual code, what does she mean? We'll get into it, right? Um, Photographs alter and enlarge our notions of what is worth looking at and what we have a right to observe, all right? Photographs alter and enlarge our notions of what is worth looking at and what we have a right to observe. So there's a couple of things here, all right, that we need to unpack, a couple of ideas, all right. Um, It's a question of, um, you know, we make decisions about what, what kind of photos we're going to take, how we frame things, all right. There's a kind of politics to the idea, like, for instance, you know, if you take a picture, you know, if Uncle, if Uncle Frank or Uncle John or Aunt Sarah takes a picture at the Thanksgiving gathering and she cuts off everybody's heads, you know, and everyone looks at the photo, they're like, Aunt Sarah, you cut off everybody's heads from the top, you know, that's, you don't do that, you know, right? There's a kind of, there's this, there's all these kind of, implicit ideas of how things are framed you know what is worth photographing right when we go to paris right it's like or if we go to niagara falls right are we taking pictures of the pavement are we taking no we're taking pictures of the eiffel tower we're taking pictures of the falls that is the thing that is the event that is what we have deemed to be important in that particular activity so that we get this sense, we start to develop this sense of like how to photo these norms of what is worthy of being photographed and how to photograph stuff. These conventions, these kind of visual codes that we have about the proper, and we, and nowadays we mess around with those codes, right? It's like, you know, Nowadays, it's just become this thing that, you know, if you're taking pictures for Christmas and the entire family is gathered together, you know, it's like it's not uncommon for everybody to do, like, the funny face picture or the picture where everybody's kind of like, oh, like looking at, like, a monster coming or, like, all, like, facing the other way. You know, we, we play with it. We play, we play with those conventions in our own day-to-day life. You know, so there's there's this idea of like, but there's this idea of these conventions and these norms um, that will, in Sontag's mind, have very have ethical um, ramifications, will have politi- political r- ramifications. Um, in photojournalism, this will become a big thing. In documentary journalism, it will become a big thing, you know. What, how to, uh, and we'll get into, and we'll get deeper into this, you know, <clears throat> how, um, how do you respect the rights of the suffering? You know, how do you write, how do you, how do you respect, it's like, where do you draw the line between exploit, between, um, 
providing a public service in documentary or photojournalism and ex- or exploiting somebody. How do you um, enter um, a different culture and represent that culture with this, uh, especially like non-Western cultures or indigenous cultures? You know, how do you um, respect that culture, um, this non-Western culture with this Western um, form of um, framing things up. There's always these like kind of moral and ethical questions that spring up about photography, right? And it comes down to even things like, you know, for instance, we were talking the other day about, um, I was having a meeting with a couple of actors and we were talking about the scene we wanted to do um, using a bunch of kids, you know, and how, and the logistics of having to get like release forms for from all those kids' parents, um, you know, in order to like make that work, you know, because you know there there are certain like ethical um, ethical um, restrictions and uh, uh, about uh, photographing kids, you know, more often than not in like broadcast news, you know, when they go in. To like do like you know a school a, a story about a school or a story about kindergarten or whatever you know an ethical video videographer won't um, show the kids faces he'll like find he or she will find ways of like you know like either either like getting their feet or getting the back of their heads or you know because there's always like legalities involved all right in photographing minors unless they're yours and then you have a right to like. You know, do whatever you want to them, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, for instance, you know, Bongiorno lived at a time in human history, um, it was this form of child abuse that child protective services had not yet gotten wind of, all right, but Bongiorno's parents would put him in different, very, very uncomfortable clothes, um, that were only used for special occasions and, 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 and drag him down to a studio where there was a photographer and, um, and be for, and be forced to have photographs taken of me. All right. And, you know, up to and including one time, and I'm just going to be totally honest about it and then we can just let it go. All right. Where Bonjour's parents put him in a sailor suit marched him to the photographer and had said photographer take pictures of Bonjourno in a sailor suit, okay? These things would later, you know, Child Protection Services later on, you know, a decade or so later, understood the nature of this abuse, you know, and started coming in and doing, <laughs> coming in and doing interventions, you know, it's like, you know, that they realized that, you know, you shouldn't put your kid in a sailor suit. You know, it's like, or dress him up in something, like, especially today on Halloween. You know, it's like, you should never, like, dress your kid up like a hot dog or a hamburger, you know, if he doesn't want to, you know, against his will, you know, um, or an ear of corn or, you know, um, whatever. Photographs are a grammar, and even more importantly, an ethics of seeing. They are a grammar and an ethics of seeing, all right? We need to dig this. We need to dig into this a little more before we dig into it yet. Finally, the most grandiose result of the photographic enterprise is to give us a, us the sense that we can hold the whole world in our heads as an anthology of images. It's a very very interesting idea. This idea that um, remember what Berger was saying about. Western oil painting and photography, how it's a kind of, there's a kind of, how do I say it, acquisitiveness to it, you know, that, you know, we collect, not only do we collect photos, but there's this feeling when we take a picture of something that we kind of have ownership, uh, we kind of have it in some kind of real way, you know, it's like, you know, when I go, to Niagara, Niagara Falls, and I take a picture. Um, you know, now I kind of have, not, you know, this sense of like, now I got it, now I have, it's like, it's kind of like the same kind of drive that um, we can see in other phenomena, like baseball cards, 
right? Base, well, were baseball cards, right? Some of you remember baseball cards. I'm sure maybe some of you even like collect baseball cards. Or your parents did, or your grandparents definitely did. Baseball cards were a big thing. And baseball cards were essentially what? This collection of pictures of everybody on the roster of that team on that given year. And the whole idea of going and buying these packs of random cards... They usually had this piece of gum in it, um, this piece of chewing gum that was really, it tasted like wax with like coated sugar on it. It's like no one really, you know, that's why, you know, the dentist loved like this piece of like gum they had. The dentist, I think it was a dentist thing. I think the dentist got together with like the trading card companies and said, yeah, put this thing in there. (laughs) It's like we're getting a lot of business that way. Um, But essentially what were, what were, um, you would trade them. And you would want to get a full set, right? The, the, the whole there was this whole drive, and you gamers, you video gamers, know exactly what I'm talking about about collecting things. About it's like you know you want the full set, you know whether it be skins or whether it be prizes or whatever. Same thing with like baseball cards, all right? And this acquisitiveness to it, like I want the whole set, you know. And this is what Sontag is saying that. We have that kind of sense of wanting to get the whole world with pictures, right? Um, this, this acquisitive possessiveness to things. And that's the same kind of thing, for instance, that drives like um, paparazzi, um, getting pictures of celebrities, or even, even pick people that, even like just like, you know, workaday people that like to. You know, go to places and meet celebrities when they make personal appearances and get, you know, here's me with Burt Reynolds. You know, here's me with the late, great Sean Connery. Here's me with, like, so-and-so. Um, this idea that, like, when we have a picture of them, this is true of the autograph picture, too. We, we have a piece of our, of our celebrity. We have a kind of, we, we have a piece of them. And we'll talk more about that with Bazan. All right, Andre Bazan will talk more about this idea of kind of extracting something from the I, I, the object or person um, that is possessible. All right, so it's this that she's talking about. All right, she brings up this film, and this is a good place to. Um, she says um, in the essay, paragraph two, she says to collect photographs is to collect the world. Movies and television programs light up walls, flicker and go out. But with still photographs, the image itself is an object. All right, she talked 1977. Photographs are what? Something that we can hold. All right, they're not ephemeral, like digital photography. You know, you go and you get prints and you're holding them in your hands. This idea that the image is an object, lightweight, cheap to produce, and easy to carry about, accumulate store right we collect it's like you know any of you who have hazarded like you know your grandparents um or even your parents like attics or closets will oftentimes find these like um photographs you know pictures of uh family photos and whatnot it's like you know speaking of which on journal recently got from his aunt, Louise, a bunch of photographs that I need to use in my documentary that I am currently working on of my mom. I didn't have a lot of pictures of my mom, so I went and my aunt Louise had these pictures, full pictures, right? Of my mom. And there's one in here. Uh, do not ever, ever, ever share this with anybody. Yes, it's you know who with his mom. And to be honest with you, it's like my brother Frank is actually in this picture. I was joking around with him. He is in the picture because my mother was pregnant with him. At the time, he was in, he was he was in attendance in that picture. But this whole idea of 
having pictures, having family pictures. Um, you know, we'll talk about this. This is this this I, this connection with the past that we have. Sontag makes a reference to this film by a famous French director by the name of Jean-Luc Godard. Jean-Luc Godard, um, he started making, he was a, primarily a filmmaker, and um, he came out in the late 50s with a group of other um, French directors, both male and female, but primarily male, um, which who would become like this movement of this kind of like um, and t- movement, move this in, in intelligentsia um, film, like these really cerebral, um, artistic, um, theoretically driven um, photographers, or, or rather filmmakers, and they'll call them the French New Wave. All right, the French term. I know I'm gonna like slaughter it. It was the novel, the, the Nouvelle Vague, the Nouvelle Vague, the, the French New Wave. And these photographers and these um, filmmakers would all be um, kind of working with and, and with theory about like you know, and they would be very political too. Their films are, are very very like political and innovative, and they're trying different things. And we'll talk more. And Andre Bazan will kind of be a mentor to these directors of the French New Wave. And they will include such names as Jean-Luc Godard and uh, Francois Truffaut and Eric Romare and Claude Chabrot and Agnes Varda. You know, there were some women involved. Um, and, they'll, and they'll be rethinking, like, the rules of the... Literally, like, the rules that it's, it's ironic. There's a French film called The Rules of the Game. They'll be, th- be, be trying to, like, rethink the rules of, of film. And they'll actually be very, very influential on a whole new generation of Hollywood filmmakers by the uh, late 60s and early 70s, all right? And we'll talk more about that when we get to it. But um, she makes reference to this Godard film called Les Carabiniers, which translates as The Rifleman, all right? If I get ambitious, I'll actually, like, insert a scene from this film into um into the video probably not. um it was called the rifleman and she says um in godard's le carabinier two sluggish lumpen peasants two like joe schmoes um are lured into joining joining the king's army by the promise that they'll be able to loot rape kill or do whatever else they please to the enemy and get rich but the suitcase of booty that Michel and Ulysses triumphantly bring home years later to their wives, turns out to contain only pictures, postcards, hundreds of them, of monuments, department stores, mammals, wonders of nature, methods of transport, works of art, and other classified treasures from around the globe. Godard's gag, she says, it's a gag, all right, vividly parodies the equivocal magic of the photographic image, all right? It's a scene, so let's do a breakdown. These guys go and join the army with the promise from the recruiters of going to foreign lands and and, and getting a whole bunch of stuff to bring back. Loot. Booty. You know, not booty, but not not the way that um, hip-hop booty, not that kind of booty, but booty is like, you know, riches, you know, things that you get due to conquest, right? And, you know, they come back from the war and their wives are sitting there with bated breath and like, what you guys bring us? You know, it's like, what grand jewels? And and they dump a bunch of postcards out, you know, because Godard is trying to say something about the nature of photography, how it how it entails a kind of um, possess, you know, a possess, a possessiveness to it, and we've already talked about this. So we've already kind of um, covered a lot of ground in this idea with Berger and ways of seeing. You know, specifically in in um, episode three, right? Episode three, where he talks about how um, oil painting, um, that tradition of oil painting, was about 
among many other things, painting what people already had. Painting possessions and this kind of sense of like, you know, this whole style of painting, which gave everything a kind of tactile, kind of acquisitive, like a kind of um, objectiveness, you know, like a material, like richness to it, you know, so that people would want to possess it, you know, and, you know, he would say the same, that's what we do with color photography, all right, so there's that, and that's a good, and that's a really, if you get it, if you decide to get into studying film to any degree, if you go to if you transfer out, you go to film school, or you study film, or you, or you, you know, have the have the bad sense of like getting into things like film theory. <laughs> it's like like Bonjourno did. Um, you will inevitably um, have to come up against um, or see some films by the French New Wave, um, and see some films by Godard and uh, and uh, guys like uh, Truffaut. And uh, come to terms with them. You know, you will not, you will, you will not be able to avoid them. All right. She'll, she'll go on. Page four of the essay. It's like Sontag will say, to photograph is to appropriate the thing photographed. All right. This is kind of Berger again. To photograph something is to appropriate the thing photographed. It means putting oneself into a certain relation to the world that feels like knowledge, all right? Emphasis on the term feels. It fe because she's going to say something about whether, because later on she's going to pose a, a series of questions about whether photographs are, in fact, true knowledge or merely a kind of stand-in, a kind of image of knowledge, you know? And what is the true knowledge, con what is the true knowledge content of of photographs she's gonna she's going to um kind of turn that on its head right so she says so let's repeat the photograph is to appropriate the thing photograph it means putting oneself into a certain relation to the world when i photograph something i am putting myself into a relation to the world all right which is different than me not having a photograph. The relationship that I have walking down the street without a photo, without a camera is far different than the relationship I have to the world when I'm out there on an assignment, you know, that Tara Monaco gave me to go take pictures, right? My relationship is different. And this relationship to the world, she says it feels like knowledge and therefore like power. It feels like power. Photography gives us a kind of power over the world, a kind of control over the world that she'll talk about. And, and, and the psychological, um, the psychological um, reasons why we take photographs, all right, as a way of gaining control of our world, of our environment, all right, that, you know, perhaps we, you know, before the fact didn't feel like we had control over. You know, photographs give us a kind of assuredness to something that might be fle otherwise fleeting, right? Photographed images do not seem to be statements about the world so much as pieces of it. They're not statements about the world, should say, as much as they're kind of like pieces of it, almost like pieces of a puzzle, right? In which you know, if the if the puzzle, I mean, I'm like stepping out and like giving a metaphor here. If the puzzle is the full thing, a photograph is more like a piece of the full thing. It's a fragment. It's not the full thing or the thing in itself, right? Um, they don't seem to be statements about the world so much as pieces of it. Miniatures of reality. Miniatures of reality that anyone can acquire. Right? Remember what we were talking about in terms of like the democratizing elements of taking photos, right? Much different than oil painting, right? Now, right, and you know, think of the instance of like the mass reproduction of like works of art, right? At one time, you needed to go to the Louvre to have 
any kind of relationship with a painting like the Mona Lisa. You know, now it's like all you got to do is like kind of Google it, you know, hit print, and there it is in your hand. Is it the real thing? No. You know, and, and we know what happens due to that, right? That the original, you know, gains a certain kind of monetary value because it's just the original, right? Um, so it's miniatures of reality that anyone can acquire, right? So we have this whole idea of packaging the world, right? That so this whole so what is she trying to say? She's trying to make a case for this idea that, you know, with photography, we gain a kind of control and domination over the world and our environment. All right? Or at least the illusion of such. All right? Because I think that you know, as she goes on with the essay, she'll say that this power that we ha that we think we have over reality is really kind of illusory, all right, and kind of ephemeral. And she'll say it's not really it's not real power, um, and it's not real knowledge, all right, of, of of any kind of estimable way that okay. And she'll and she'll argue about it, and, and she'll argue this in the essay using it different examples. So we have this whole idea of packaging the world, you know, and for a very, very long, for a long time there was this cliche of the Japanese chores, the, the Japanese culture, at least it's not bash anybody's culture, but there were, and, and it was kind of a, a cliche that you would see in films, you know, the comedic Japanese tourists that had like a bunch of cameras um, you know, due to the fact that you know, Jap uh, you know, by the late fifties, you know, Japan was was recovering in industrially in terms of their economy, and they were like, you know, out and about, and 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 they were very technological. So they took a lot of pictures. They took a lot of pictures. So certain stereotypes and cliches sprung up around that. But you know, um. I, th I think that what Sontag is attempting to say in this essay is that we're all kind of like that Japanese tourist and our, and our need to take photos, all right? Does everybody feel that way? No, you know. But um, think about, like, all the people you know and the ways in which, you know, it's like things... We've moved into a society, you know, through the... Um, preponderance of social now social um, media like Instagram and Snapchat and all this that really induce us and compel us to photograph as much as possible you know um, hence the insatiability you know she'll talk a little later about a film by Chris Marker once again a famous a less famous French filmmaker who was doing far more like experimental um, work than Godard. Um, she'll talk about a film of his, Chris Marker's film, and I would butcher the French because I don't know French. Um, si j'avais quatre, it's like it, it, it translates as four camels, believe it or not, four camels. But in the film, Chris Marker, it's a brilliantly orchestrated meditation on photographs of all sorts and themes and suggests a subtler and more rigorous way of packaging and enlarging still photographs. All right. What is the film? You can YouTube it. All right. If you want. I think it's on YouTube. What Chris Marker does basically is just have, it's like a photo, it's like a, a, a photo, um, a photo display, you know, one picture after another. And he wants to say something about the order of, like, kind of imposing this um, order and length to our, our, our picture viewing. Um, he wants to say something about the way that we take pictures, the way that we look at pictures. And he wants to kind of structure that in a way that would otherwise, he wants to structure that into an experience that would otherwise be a lot more under our control, and what that and, and what that does to the viewer when you're kind of watching a film that basically consists of photographs, you know, and you're forced to. And other and other experimental filmmakers will do other kind of experiments with that, 
you know, what it means to impose a certain amount of time to view, you know, a film and not look away, you know, and not just turn the page. But when somebody is kind of turning the pages, like, for you, and she just says, but, um, she says, but photographs transcribed in a film cease to be collectible objects as still, as they still are when they are served up in books. She's, and basically what she's saying here in these paragraphs is that, you know, what it's like a book of photos and a, and a film make that consists of photos and photos in our hand um, are different experiences, all right, of, of the photographic medium, you know. And um, so that's kind of a no-brainer. She'll go on, right? One of the other reasons, one of the other modes of using photographs is what? She'll say, photographs furnish evidence, all right? We use them as evidence that something occurred. And now, I mean, certainly, you know, in this, you know, rapidly um, 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 accelerating surveillance society that we have, where everything is being photographed all the time in order to keep society stable, whether it be, you know, the, the uh, cameras in the grocery store, you know, to be able to provide, provide evidence of shoplifting, you know, or, or, you know, or evidence. You know, it's like, you know, you, you see some of these forensic shows like CSI, you know, or, or whatever. You know, or these old, or these old like courtroom dramas, and more often than not, there's like you know, things become provable if you have pictures of them, right? It's like you know, you know, there's. I wish I had a dollar for like every like episode of Perry Mason or some or, um, what was the one with um, Andy Griffith? Um, I can't even remember. Someone like like it's like where you know so and so was having an affair with so-and-so, and it's like, well, I got a picture of them coming out of the motel room together. They must have done something. You know, it's, evident, it's like this idea that if there's pictures of it, then it must have happened, you know, and if it's like wrongdoing of any kind of moral or ethical thing, we have a way of, like, proving it. Photographs furnish evidence. Something we hear about, no doubt, but doubt seems proven when we are shown a photograph. Well, obviously it happened. There's a photo of it, Right. In one version of its utility, the camera record incriminates, right? In one mode of using the camera, it can incriminate somebody. If I got a picture of somebody, like, breaking the law, a lot of times, you know, you know, but remember when she's writing, too. Remember that she's writing in 1977, before Photoshop, Right? Before the ability to alter photographs, to provide phony photographs, you know, to take the head, it's like, you know, um, and well, and we understand the trick photography has always been a thing. That's not to say that there wasn't like, you know, that they couldn't alter photographs in the 70s or even before that. We'll talk about, you know, like, for instance, governments like the Soviet government. You know, when somebody would get assassinated, they would put photos back out with the person, like, airbrushed out. You know, and that would happen. In the, they had the technology to do that in the 40s and 50s. So, photos have always been kind of alterable. But we will find in the digital modality with Photoshop, you know, that it's like, it's so much easier now to cut and paste stuff. You know, put somebody somewhere where they weren't. So that it changes the game. And Peter Benson is going to talk about how that becomes a, a game changer. All right. Um, photographs furnish evidence. Something we hear about, no doubt, seems proven when we're shown a photograph of it. And one version of its utility, the camera record incriminates. Starting with their use by the Paris police and the murderous roundup of communards in June of 1871. You want to know about the communards in France in 1871? I would suggest to use to Google it. All right. It was this attempt at taking for all intents and purposes. It was it was this uh, attempt by a large political group of taking of seizing power in the in the, in the French government in 1871. It was kind of a coup, and it was shut down. 
you know, which what she's trying to say is that um, it was one of the first instances where the ringleaders were rounded up solely based on their photos. Like they found them using photos. Like this is the this is this is a picture of you know you know Francois da, 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 and he was like the ringleader and we got a picture of him so we're knocking door to door until we finally like match the guy and that's you and you're going to the house of do right as we say. You know, or worse. I don't know what was done with them. Here's a picture by uh, Alfred Stieglitz, Grand Central Terminal. Alfred Stieglitz, for some of you students of photography, will know that he was um, in the uh, 20s, one of the great artistic photographers using light, um, you know, for artistic effect. You know, she wants to... And Sontag wants to talk, talk about, like, photography as art. Photography as art. And uh, what she'll say is, um, the picture, and she'll, and she'll go as far as saying, the picture, we know that the picture might distort. It might not come out right. You know, it might not be, you know, a perfect, a perfect facsimile of what we're taking a picture of. Sometimes, you know, we do things out of, like, Bon Journal, like, we'll do the video, and what he's doing right now, trying to put the video in focus, and this shouldn't be on, and that shouldn't be on, and I don't know why it is, but I'm just going to have to live with it. Um, sometimes something will be out of focus. You know, the picture may distort, but there's always a presumption that the thing that's being depicted exists, all right? We're talking about chemical photography now. We're talking about darkroom photography. If I take a picture of Aunt Harriet, and it's so blurry that you can hardly make her out at all in the picture, there's still, there's, there's still the sense, when I'm holding a picture of her, that something is there. There is a person that exists in time and space. I got a picture to prove it. Right? She says the picture may, dist may distort, but there is always a presumption that something exists or did exist, all right? You know, like with pictures of my mother, all right? My mother is no longer alive, but there is this sense when I show these pictures that she did exist, and these people, I mean, most of the people, it's like, I will tell you right now about. 98% of the people in this picture no longer exist. And yet, we have a record of this with a hard, hard print photo of proof that these people obviously existed at some point, right? Um, that something d exists or did exist, all right? Maybe it doesn't exist now, but with a proof, with a with a photo, I have incontrovertible evidence that this person was alive and breathing at one time, right? Which is like, what's in the picture? Whatever the limitations through amateurism or pretensions through artistry of the individual photographer, a photograph, any photograph, seems to have a more innocent and therefore more accurate relation to visible reality than do other mimetic objects. Mimetic objects, what does she mean? M-I-M-E-T-I-C, mimetic objects. Basically, mimetic objects are, what she's trying to say with that term is other ways of imitating reality that we do, whether it be painting as a mimetic object, you know, every, it's like, you know, something that stands in for another thing. All right, even theater can be seen as a kind of mimetic object. Or films, you know, when I make a film about when I do a biopic on Albert Einstein or Don, something like Dunkirk or some historical thing, you know, you know, ultimately, what is it? You know, it's a it's a imitation of the thing. I'm imitating it, all right. And hence, this idea, mim mimetic merely means imitation, all right. Mimesis, mimetic. So she's using this highfalutin term. You know, it's like, and she says, any photograph seems to have 
Uh, it seems to have a more innocent and therefore more accurate relation to visible reality than do other mimetic objects, right? Remember that, you know, for instance, it's like an oil painting. It's like, I, I don't know. You know, it's like that thing could have existed or maybe it didn't, right? It's like that person may have existed, you know, or maybe not. It's like there's a far different, there's a far different feeling when I see a picture of, you know, the god Apollo on his chariot, you know, going across the sun, then I do a picture of, you know, Pope so-and-so, you know, from Florence at a certain time. There's a different relationship to these things. It's like, you know, that could be just made up, you know. What she's saying is that with photos, you know, it's like it might be staged, it might, whatever it is, and, and, and Bazan will talk more about this, there's something about it that's real, you know. Even if it was totally, like, orchestrated, you know, the things or the people in it are real, all right? Um, virtual side of the noble image, like Alfred Stieglitz and Paul Strand composing mighty, unforgettable photographs decade after decade, still want, first of all, to show something out there, all right? There's still, it's like, so, what is she trying to say? She's saying, like, even these, like, artistic photographers... You know, who want to shape, who want to um, kind of have some control over their image because they want to say something about the nature of light or the nature of a certain subject. She, she says, the first priority is always that something is captured that is already, that is there. All right. Whatever their artistic pretensions, you know, this is after everything is said and done, merely a picture of the Grand Central Terminal and the people that were in it at the time. You know, um, so there's that. There's that sense with that. And let's move on. And that one's almost done. That one's for on deck for mass media. While painting in, in Jawan, while a painting or a prose description can never be other than a narrowly selective interpretation. A photograph can be treated as a narrowly selective transparency. While painting or prose description can never be other than a narrowly selective interpretation. Remember, when I write about something, I can write all day long about an orange, or an apple, or a tree, or a barnyard. All right, but it's always what? It's never giving me the, the actual thing. It's an interpretation. Same thing with painting, right? Photographs... At least, for for the sake of argument, provide us with something different. This kind of verisimilitude, all right? This truth quality to the thing that we just naturally make assumptions that a picture of a photo, like, is proof of its existence. Picture of a barn, I don't know. You know, somebody writing about a barn, that's totally up for grabs. I have no idea whether that thing exists or not. But despite the assumption of veracity that gives all photographs authority, interest, seductiveness, right? This assumption of some, uh, this assumption that we make that this thing is true, that this thing existed in one form or another. Um, the work that photographers do is no exception to the usual shady commerce between art and truth. It is not an exception to this kind of sense that no matter what is being depicted, it is always still some interpretation of the world, all right, that we make, all right, that may, that may have a bearing on the actual reality or may be so configured that it's like, it's always, a, it's always an interpretation, you know. She's making this distinction between whether a photograph gives us reality as such, reality as it is out there, or merely an interpretation of reality. And she's saying, you know, you can think what you want about the truth content of, like, writing about something, of the truth content of painting something, you know. But what she's attempting to say is that ph photography is no different. We're interpreting the world. It's not the, it's not the real, it's not the world as such. It is an interpretation of the world. All right. Um, even when photographers are most concerned with mirroring reality, 
they are still haunted by a tacit imperative of taste and conscience, right? And she'll go on to talk about, um, this is a well-known, famous uh, photograph by a photographer by the name of Dorothea Lang that comes out of, um, she comes out of the uh, WPA movement, the Works Progress Authority movement, specifically from the Farm Security Administration, and her photos will become famous for um, depicting and making a case for the poverty that was going on at the time in the Dust Bowl of the Midwest, all right? And what will Sontag say about these kind of pictures? She'll say something very important here, and what she'll say is that... Um, even when photographers are most concerned with mirroring reality, they are still haunted by tacit imperatives of taste and conscience. The immensely gifted members of the Farm Security Administration photographic project of the late 1930s, among them Walker Evans, Dorothea Lang, Ben uh, Sean, Russell Lee, would take dozens of frontal pictures of one of their sharecropper subjects until satisfied that they had gotten just the right look of the film. On film, the precise expression of the subject's face that supported their own notions about poverty, life, dignity, um, texture, exploitation, and geometry. In deciding how a picture should look and preferring one exposure to another, Photographers are always imposing standards on their subjects, all right? They're always, you know, we have many, many different art, different technological and artistic techniques in film and photography um, to, to put something in a certain light, right? To make, some, to make somebody more attractive or more sensual, all right? To make another thing more stark and more, and more garish and more, you know, um, you know, um, although there is a sense in which the camera does indeed capture reality, not just interpret it, photographs as much, are as much an interpretation of the world as paintings and drawings are. These occasions when the taking of photographs is relatively undiscriminating, promiscuous, or self-effacing do not lessen the didacticism of the whole enterprise. What does she mean by didacticism? She's saying that didactic in the sense that I'm trying to, it's like, when I'm being didactic, I'm trying to make an argument with something, about something, right? I'm, I'm trying to give you my opinion about something, all right? I'm trying to kind of shape um, the, a case. I'm making a case for something. And what Sontag is essentially saying here is that, you know, with photography, although there was this sense that the thing being photographed is totally objective, it's real, it exists in the real world, that, you know, it's like, depending on the skill of the photograph of the photographer, whether he shoots in black and white, whether he uses filters, you know, the kind of lighting that he's trying to make, that he or she is trying to make an argument for a certain idea of the thing being depicted, all right? Um, the way it's framed, all right? The way the expression on the person's face. You know, all of this has a kind of rhetorical dimension to it that is trying to make an argument. Pictures are trying to make an argument like everything else you're trying to see. These occasions, okay, so images which idealize, like most fashion and animal photography, are no less aggressive than work which makes a virtue of plainness, all right? So, you know, we have to understand this idea that stylistically a lot of times a person might just want to get the thing. You know, sometimes it's like, for instance, it's like, you know, there's a far different, there's a far different intent. You know, for instance, if you're a real estate person, like a cousin of mine, she's like a real estate person, and she's got to go out and take pictures of the houses that she's trying to sell. You know, and that picture, you know, is, is it usually, there, certainly there's, there's this, um, intent of like, I want to sell this house, all right? But, you know, it just you stand in front of the house and you take the picture, 
You know, it's not it's not like a fashion photographer. It's not like trying to put a, mo- a model selling <coughs> selling a car, a beautiful model in a car, and the way that the whole thing is set up, or a guy, you know, all like you know, brush, you know, trying to sell like a power drink or you know, a, a new Bullflex machine or whatever. You know that that is all about an interpretation of trying to like get something out of it, right? And um, here's where she starts talking about this idea that photography, there's an aggression to it. All right, she talks about this kind of not. She she's talked about this kind of acquisitiveness about being wanting to grab stuff and, and take stuff, right? Now she's talking about how it's a kind of act of aggression, an act of aggression, and um, you know what does that mean, right? Because we have to. And what does she mean? Aggressiveness can be read in photography in a lot of different ways. All right, you know, take uh, the most the most obvious example would be, for instance, the aggressiveness of paparazzi, paparazzi who. Um, wait in front of um, events or wait in front of a, a, a celebrity's house to get pictures of them, right? And how a lot of celebrities just just get weird, just, you know, and right and probably rightly so, you know, when you come out of the, every time you come out of the house, even if it's just to get the newspaper, you got nine people like hanging out of the trees trying to get a picture of you. Sooner or later, you're going to feel a little bit like, hey, wait a minute. It's like, this is like not right a little bit. Hence, you know, a lot of celebrities don't like it, you know, up to and including the idea that, you know, the, the car, the uh, automobile accident um, that killed Princess Diana of, of, of Britain, of Wales, um, was almost directly attributed to um, photo hounds, like trying to chase the car down, right, and on uh, scooters or whatever, right? So this idea of aggression, you know... And how and, and and how we kind of like, you know, for instance, you know, it would just be totally natural to be like like if somebody was if you're walking down the street and somebody just walked up to you and took a picture and then started walking away, you'd be like kinda of like, Hey, wait a minute, bro, it's like what why'd you just do that? You know, you would take you would take some umbrage, you know, to this idea. You know, hence this aggression hence this idea of aggressiveness to it, right? There's an, aggr- there's an aggression implicit in every use of the camera. This is as evident in the 1840s and the 1850s photography, photography's glorious first decades, as in all succeeding decades during which technology was made possible, which made possible an ever-increasing spread of that mentality, which looks at the world as a set of potential photographs. Skip it. Let's get this back up here. Oh, my journal just screwed up big time. Bear with me today, you guys. Bear with me. I'll make it work. I'll get back to where we are. Ooh, I'm trying to do like four things at once on this computer. She'll go on. All right, and she'll talk about the ways, the ritualistic ways that will you the rituals, and the the rituals that will use uh, photography for, and the and the way that photography itself becomes a kind of ritual. And she says here, um, and I hope this is working right because I really screwed this camera up today. Really screwed up today, bros. Um, she says recently, pho- photography has become almost as widely practiced and amused. She's talking to 1977, remember. Recently, photography has become almost as widely practiced an amusement as sex and dancing. An amusement like sex and dancing. Something we do. All right. To, I don't know why she uses sex. It's, it's, it's a thing we do. It's, a, it's like, to have fun, right? Something we do to have fun. We dance, get sad, play video games. Which means that like every mass art form, photography is not practiced by most people as an art, which is true. Most people don't have artistic intentions when they're like taking pictures of their cat 
or you know their kid down the swing or at the Chuck E. Cheese in the ball in the colored balls to be artistic about it. It's just showing something, right? It is mainly and she'll go on. It's not practiced as an art by most people. Then what is it used for by most people? What does it serve? What purpose does it serve? It is mainly a social right, she'll say. A social right, R-I-T-E, not R-I-G-H-T. Like a rite of passage, right? Like a rite of, you know, a, 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 a rite of, uh, of um, tran- you know, whatever. You know, different rites that we have. Like a religious rite, like a religious ritual almost. Rites and rituals, you know, in the ritualistic sense, right? But she'll say for the most, it is mainly a social right, a defense against anxiety. A defense against anxiety. So she's trying to say like photographs help us to assuage or, 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 or minimize our anxiety about things. We'll get more into this. What does she mean? And a tool of power. It gives us power and somehow it, it helps us to deal with anxiety. Anxiety about what? We'll find out. A photograph, okay, so that's page eight. She'll go on to page nine. A photograph gives people an imaginary possession of a past that is unreal. They also help people to take possession of a space in which they are insecure. And we'll finish up with this. Gives people an imaginary possession of a past that is unreal. What does she mean by that? Imaginary possession of a past that is unreal. All right. It's like take, for instance, these photos. Right? It's like one would think, well, it's like it looks real to me. What she'll say is like, and this, and this is something that, She's trying to say something about our, our lived experience, all right? She's trying to say something not unlike the Matrix, right? That the past as such is gone, all right? Our past, our childhood, you know, it's like it's something that um, is our feelings about that thing. Like this morning, all right? I met, it's like just like a little anecdote. I met with... Um, a person, an old, old, old college friend of mine, not old, old, but somebody that I hadn't seen in 32 years, all right, not to date myself with this, but an old college friend of mine, we lived on the same floor in the same dorm, and her kid goes to BU, and I hadn't seen her in 32 years, right, and we were reminiscing about our old days at New York in the 80s, and you know, it's like, and trying to, and, and talking about how we miss those days and all that. And one, always, and it's like, and I had failed to point out, but it's something I always think about. It's like, we always kind of remember our memories of the past are an interpretation of it, of something that um, is no longer here, right? It's my own personal, it's like, I might remember all the good, like we kind of, Nostalgia is always like this. We always kind of remember the good stuff. We always, but we always kind of like sideline all those like periods of like boredom or anxiety that went on when we were like 19 years old. And there was like, you know, it's like, or, or, or certain types of people will just remember, just all, you know, remember it's like, you know, we always kind of like cue in on what, whatever argument we want to make. You know, like if we want to say, for instance, and this is not to take away from the reality of people that, for instance, you know, had a, an abusive parent or were in a, an abusive relationship. And we tend to kind of frame that past in a way which kind of emphasizes all the like the bad stuff, right? When more often than not, there were these instances where things were good. You know, and we do the other, and we, and we do the flip side. We have a tendency to romanticize a past. You know, we remember all the good stuff, but we don't remember, like, you know, all, like, the bullshit that we had to put up with. You know, um, that's the nature of memories. So she wants to say something about photographs allowing us to take possession of a past that is essentially 
are just an interpretation of it. You know, it's like without photographs, how would we know? How would we remember? It's like, you know, it's like we know how faulty our memories are about things, you know, how we remember things often differently from how they really were, and we all kind of do it to one extent or another. And then she says that they also help people to take possession of a space in which they are insecure, right? A possession of a place in which they are insecure, right? For instance, it's like, and she'll go on, like, say I go to, you know, say I go to a place, you know, and I don't know my way around, you know, and I feel somewhat ill at ease because it's not my usual stomping ground. You know, it's one thing to, like, you know, go to Broome and go to McDonald's and blah. It's another thing to, like, leave that whole environment and, for instance, maybe go, you know, to some place in the Mideast or whatever. It's like, all of a sudden, I'm in this new environment and there's some natural anxiety that is created, you know, when I'm in a different, in a different place altogether. And she says that photographs kind of serve this function of giving us this power over a place that otherwise we would feel insecure around. And that's, you know, basically what she's saying there. All right. So we've run out of time. And we'll get, and these are different aspects of, like, what she was, and we've talked about every, these are different facets of photography that we use them for. You know, we talked about this, in, with, when we talked about Berger, we talked about this whole idea of the selfie and the purposes that it served and this whole idea of objectifying ourselves. You know, and, you know, and, you know, here's a picture of a guy, you know, taking a picture of, you know, somewhere in the third world, probably in, like, northern Africa of a child, you know, in total poverty. You know, the different means, the different, you know, the Japanese tourists, but all, like, different ways that we use photo photographs. All right, I won't, like, kick it to death. Tuesday... We'll finish up Sontag because we have to. Um, there's a lot going on in this essay. I know that. I understand that. You know. However, I think that it's a very, very important essay for us to pick apart. So I think we want to spend just a little more time on Tuesday with Sontag and then move on to Bazan and Benson um, so that we can move forward, um, you know, taking apart like this whole idea of photography. So by the time you see this, Halloween will be over. And it will be over for me, but I hope it was good for you. I hope you had many, I hope, you know, cool things happened. And, you know, you, you won the costume contest coming as, you know, a, a coronavirus particle. Like, and you was so, like, you were so, or, or, you know, you were so lifelike. Like, people, like, instantly, like, put masks on. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's like, let's wrap it up. But We'll see you on Tuesday. Oh.